I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Adam Panay, who's Managing Director of Row Motion. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So we're here at the Benchmark Minerals Week. To start, could you tell our audience what were some of the main trends you saw in the EV space in 2019, and did anything surprise you? Yeah, I'd say that actually the market underperformed compared to expectations. That's primarily driven by what happened in China with the reduction of subsidies. We thought that that was built into the market more than perhaps it was. Um, and the second is actually that in North America as well, the market's been fairly weak in terms of the growth has been 2% versus expectations probably over 10%. So there's two areas of weakness there, but on the other hand, Europe's been relatively strong and probably slightly stronger than we'd expected. It's been strong growth in Germany, the Netherlands, France. So, you know, it's a bit of a mixed picture, but overall I'd say the market has not performed as well as had been anticipated. All right, so I'm actually going to ask you about uh, next year and where, whether you think demand will pick up in 2020. Are there any particular regions around the world where you expect growth uh, to be higher than others? I mean, just by virtue of the fact that 2019 was fairly weak in North America, you'd expect there'd be some recovery there. So you'd expect that North America could be quite a strong point next year. Uh, Europe, I think, will continue to grow um, in a relatively robust way, just because in the in, in 2020, you start to see the phase in of new CO2 emission standards. That's going to have a big impact on, uh, on uh, OEM's behavior. Uh, and that will continue into 2021 as well. China, again, you know, now that the subsidy has been curtailed and it will be phased out probably next year as well, there's still other targets there that are going to need to be met on the new energy uh, vehicle policies and, and also VAT rebates as well. So that uh, creates a condition where from a relatively weak performance in 2019, you should see a good recovery in 2020, probably towards the end of the year. All right. And um, in terms of subsidies, I know it's a it's been a big topic this year with with the Chinese subsidies and, and whatnot. But I wanted to ask you about government policies and subsidies elsewhere. How important are those for the industry? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, if, effectively, you can see this as an infant industry in some respects. And I'd say that, you know, you can break it down into subsidies and probably incentives. So there's a package of measures, really, that can be implemented. So. There's only a, really a, maybe a dozen countries where you have direct cash incentives, okay? And the, but the, the majority of cases is VAT rebates, things like free parking, free use of toll roads and so on. Those things are relatively easy to sustain for a longer period uh, rather than direct cash incentives because you don't have a direct fisc fiscal impact straight away. So in short, really, you know, they are, those, that package of incentives rather than just subsidies is, is crucial. Um, but only really for the next five years or so. So the, the, you know, there will be a transition in this market to the point where uh, the production of e electric vehicles becomes relatively uh, cost comparable to, to internal combustion engine vehicles. There's a few things to really think about there. There's a difference between cost of production and price. So uh, OEMs will expect to make negative margins on these vehicles for the next couple of years at least cross-subsidized from their internal combustion engine business, but they need, particularly in Europe as well, they need to, to move to this strategy in order to meet emissions targets. Otherwise, they're on the hook for large fines as well. So, yeah, just to say that, you know, the, the, the incentives and subsidies part of the picture is, is important in the short and medium term, but thereafter it becomes less important, I'd say. All right, and um, let's talk about batteries. I know that here at the conference, uh, you were talking a little bit about what automakers are looking in the short terms in terms of batteries, also medium term, long term. Can you share briefly your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, let's look, let's look at it in two ways. So one is on the anode, and really that's where the major changes will come. Um, so in the short term, there's the key, the key issues that just transition from purely synthetic anodes for EV to a blend of natural flake graphite and then potentially towards the dominance of natural flake graphite. From a performance point of view, OEMs wouldn't necessarily want to do that, but just it's, a, it's purely an availability issue and a cost issue. So that, that transition is happening already. In the medium term, there's the introduction of silicon, both dosed, which is already happening, uh, and then potentially silicon dominant anodes. And then in the very long term, the introduction of solid state, which is effectively a different battery in some respects. You don't have a graphite anode, or, you, or at least you don't necessarily need to have a graphite anode. But you know that all of those things are, are step changes, and they 
take a while to become actualized and commercialized. Um, and also by the time that you start to see some of those bigger changes come in, the market will be much, much bigger, the applications will be much more diverse, and there'll be a role for everything, frankly. Um, graphite probably, you know, not probably even is, is almost certainly the mass market technology uh, for anodes, so for your standard passenger car vehicles, um, at, at least for the next decade. On the cathode side, you've seen a, a move towards high nickel already from 111 to 523 and now 622. Um, you know, that transition is going to continue, but again, it's that the story is just more nuanced in the sense that as the market expands, applications become different, the types of vehicles on the road become, become more diverse. And again, there's applications and there's solutions per application. So there's a role for a lot of things here. Um, the other one is LFP as well. There's a, you know, a, a, the, the, when the market in China was subsidy driven, the subsidy was contingent on range. Now that the subsidy isn't there, you don't necessarily need to worry about range so much uh, from, a, from, a, from a price point of view. Uh, which al allows the market to then adopt a greater uh, um, resurgence in LFP uh, for cheaper vehicles, budget vehicles, that w where, where the performance characteristics of LFP are more important than some of the performance characteristics of an NCM cathode, for example. So there's lots of things happening there. Um, but, you know, the primary thing in the short term is availability and, and quality. Uh, so you'd rather stick with a, uh, an incumbent technology that you can rely on. Uh, and in the longer term, it will be energy density and then performance as well, and obviously cost. All right, so just uh, touching back on the anode side of the battery, so you're optimistic about the role of graphite then on the anode side, and would it be room for both natural and synthetic? It just has to be. There's the, there just isn't, isn't going to be enough synthetic in the market uh, to supply, the, the supply a, a, you know, a penetration rate, say 30%. You're going to have to use natural flake. Most OEMs are coming to terms with that. Most anode manufacturers are coming to terms with that. And it's a, a function of time, really, getting over some of the technical hurdles. But it's already started to happen already. All right. And for cathodes and developments on that side, uh, did anything surprise you this year? N not especially, because most of the, the timeline for those things you can see from relatively far out. You know what vehicles are coming. Uh, and you, you can predict, to a large extent, what is going to be in them. Um, but just to maybe reframe that in terms of what were the trends then, well, you, you, saw, for, you saw for the first time 811 come into the market. Um, it's really only in a handful of vehicles. Those vehicles sell quite well, so actually the penetration was relatively high uh, this year. So we were saying by the end of the year, 1.5% for NCM 811 uh, of the total EV market. Um, and also, you know, LFP is stuck in there and is starting to, you start to see growth in LFP again now. So there, there are two things, but I mean, to a large extent, we could see them coming. All right. And for the investors that are watching us today and they're interested in the EV space, what do you think are some of the factors they should pay attention to in 2020 that could impact the market? Yeah, so there's a couple of things really. Don't um, get carried away with this transition from plug-in hybrid as a, as, a, as a viable technology towards pure battery electric. It will happen, but not. You know, that you're likely to see more hybrids on the road, or sold at least, uh, in the next couple of years. Um, than you have previously. So that's, you know, it's an intermediate technology. It's what a lot of the Western OEMs are banking on to get them to CO2 targets uh, before transitioning to battery electric. Um, and so that's one thing. So keep an eye out for that. And then also that, you know, you're really going to see the, start to see the rollout of pure battery electric vehicles uh, that, that were designed uh, and, con and conceived as electric vehicles rather than retrofitted internal combustion engine vehicles. That's a big change. Again, it's going to take a while to feed through, but that, that's, that's something that over time will, will uh, allow this market to develop properly. All right, Adam, my last question for you today. Are there any missing trends? Are there anything that investors should be talking more about that we're not talking about enough in this space? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, charging is a big one. Uh, we've done some work recently on North American charging infrastructure, and then we're doing some work now on European charging infrastructure. The scale of investment is is significant okay so you you're moving from uh it, it, when you start to see more of these vehicles on the road you have to start to develop a high-speed charging infrastructure the also you're going to start to see more use of these vehicles in urban environments rather than in suburban environments so you, there'll be an increasing number of people that can't charge at home uh, because they don't have a driveway for instance um, and the order of magnitude for the investments 
in North America alone is another 37 billion we're estimating by 2030. That's going to be an equivalent number for Europe as well. So that, it, that's a, that has to happen. Um, and from an investment point of view, that's an interesting opportunity as well because there's really no business model as such for that. There's lots of opportunities there, you know, advertising on the charging unit and food and retail. Uh, but that's something that needs to be worked out and, and, and you know, there's potentially quite a lot of money to be made there. So that's something that I would, if I was looking for a complete new opportunity, that would be where I'd put some of my attention. All right, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Once again, I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network. And here with me today is Adam Panay, who is uh, the Managing Director of Rural Motion.